Okay, fair use, and this is for educational purposes. What the hell is up with that? Observe what President Trump has just spoken as of recently. It's very important. The things which are taking place right now, the words which are being spoken by your leaders, take heed to what your leaders are doing. Do not let it pass by you, because your life depends on everything that they do and everything that they say. Observe what President Trump has spoken, and we're going to give some further commentaries, and I want you to observe the people in the background. Who surrounds the president? Uh, border security. You know, Republicans want very strong border security, and honestly, the Democrats, or most of them, it's hard to believe, but most of them want open borders, and that leads to crime and leads to other problems. And you know, I don't mind the... having the issue of border security on my side. If we have to close down the country over border security, I actually like that in terms of an issue, but I don't want it to be an issue. I want it to be something that what the country needs. It's not really an issue. It's something the country needs. It's common sense. The country needs it. <coughs> we need protection. We need border security. We need security from drugs that are pouring into our country. They're coming in right through that southern border, and we need a wall. We need border security, and part of border security is a wall. So I don't mind owning that issue. I mean, Chuck's problem is that I'll take it. If we close down the country, I will take it, because we're closing it down for border security, and I think I win that every single time. Okay? Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Friends, let's go. Make your way out. Thank you. Very much. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. This recording of Trump speaking on shutting down the government was the result of border security and he was speaking with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer on this subject to make the long story short here is what I want to share with you I had pointed out to you that you need to pay attention to the people behind Trump because the people behind Trump are the advisors of Trump these people have power I want you to ask yourself, when the camera zooms out, what are these three Jesuits doing behind Trump? You see, these three, though they may appear as Catholics, these are Jesuits. Jesuits who are advising Trump on what to do. These Jesuits have one mission, and that mission is to bring back glory back to the papacy. Trump was trained and educated by a Jesuit. When we visit his vice president, Mike Pence, he calls himself a born-again evangelical Catholic. He is basically uniting Catholics and Protestants together. And make sure you take note that Trump, who is a Jesuit-trained president, when he was selecting the Supreme Court justices, he elected, or selected should I say, Catholics. Catholics are now the official majority in the Supreme Court. All of this is going somewhere, so observe. While he is selecting Catholics to represent the Supreme Court justices, he claims to be a Protestant. But it's very interesting. The Protestant Reformation was declared to be over in the year 2017, precisely on October 31st, 2017 at the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And the people who declared that the Protestant Reformation is over and declared that we are all Catholics now are the exact same people who are also amongst the advisors of President Donald Trump. The likes of being Kenneth Copeland, and a few other big names. I'm not even going to go and list them, but you can see the pictures that I'm showing you. These people are evangelicals, yet they have said that the Protestant Reformation is over, which means there no longer exists Protestantism, which means we are all Catholics now. Now the point is, if we are all Catholics now, that means that we are all subject to the agenda of the papacy and of the Roman Catholic Church. What is the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church, you may ask? Well, it's quite simple. The agenda of the Roman Catholic Church can be found in the Pope's 2015 encyclical, 
entitled Laudato Si. This encyclical sums up the movement that the Catholic Church is pushing in these last days. And this movement can be summed up by two simple words. Climate change. Climate change is the movement in which the Roman Catholic Church is pushing in these very last days. But you have to remember, this climate change is not just a movement that is just for the sake of the environment, no. This climate change is going to bring back glory to the Vatican, to the Roman Catholic Church. Let me show you just how powerful the Pope is. You see, in May of 2015, Pope Francis released Laudato Si. Laudato Si is the second encyclical of Pope Francis. The encyclical has the subtitle, On Care for Our Common Home, and quote. In it, the Pope critiques consumerism and irresponsible development, laments environmental degradation and global warming and calls all people of the world to take, and I quote, swift and unified global action. Following the release of his encyclical Laudato Si, the Pope then spoke before the United Nations in September of that very same year. And it's quite simple what he was talking about before the United Nations. He was simply promoting Laudato Si. His speech before the world leaders was revolved around climate change and about environmental protection. Here's the interesting thing. That very same year in the fall of 2015, an agreement known as the Paris Climate Agreement was drafted. On Google, this is what the Paris Agreement is about. It says, and I quote, the Paris Agreement is an agreement within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change dealing with greenhouse gas emissions, mitigation, adaptation, and finance starting in the year 2020. Now what's interesting about the Paris Climate Agreement is that should any nation try to get out, once you sign in and you are a part of this agreement, you are automatically bound for three years at least. So, if you try to pull yourself out of this agreement, you still have to remain a part of this agreement for at least a minimum of three years. So when President Trump took presidency and became the 45th President of the United States of America, when he tried to pull America out, he could not pull America out until America remains at least for three years. Obama was the one who signed the Paris Agreement, which means that America is not necessarily out. America is still a part of the Paris Agreement, despite what many people may think. That simply means that regardless of Trump's statement about him not believing in climate change, that can very well change at any time. Now, there are many people who say that President Trump and Pope Francis are on two different sides and they are actually against each other with regards to their beliefs. For example, one promotes socialism, the other one is promoting capitalism. One is a globalist, the other a nationalist. You get the idea. When you observe these two key players, America and Rome, and you start to break down what each of them are doing, you actually see a pattern that can be summed up with a theory known as the Hegelian dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic dictates that if you have a thesis, there will be an antithesis, and the two will always result in a synthesis. It is easily summed up as problem, reaction, solution. America must remain in the Paris Agreement until 2020. November of 2020. That ultimately means that anything can happen between now and then. While Trump may hint that he is against the Paris Agreement, it's very interesting that he is bringing on board on his members of advisors, the Roman Catholics, and yet choosing Roman Catholics 
to be the ones to occupy the seats of the Supreme Court justices. While he is claiming to be against the Paris Agreement against the Pope's idea, Trump brings Catholics directly from the Vatican to be his advisors. It's very interesting that while Trump shows that he is against the papacy, he is the one who actually is introducing the union of church and state. The image of the beast is only possible with Trump. He has brought a union of church and state, something that the Vatican loves, while yet making it seem like he is against the Vatican's ideas. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. It does not add up. What's happening is the atmosphere is actually being created. It's being ripened so that the people will be the ones to demand that they want a climate change law to be passed. And they want work-free Sundays for the sake of protecting the environment, for the sake of humanity. They are going to be the ones to demand that the state implements this. And once the state implements this, it goes worldwide. France right now is doing this. Remember, the Trump presidency has vowed to give power back to the people. He is simply shifting the power from the federal government and giving it back to the states. The states are going to be able to work independently. That is his idea of making America great again. Which means if one state decides to bring in the death penalty, that state can be able to do so. If another state decides to bring in a climate change law, they can do so. If another state decides that they would like to ban shopping on Sundays, they can do so. That is how America used to be in the first place. The states were acting independently of the federal government, but they abused it. Now here is something that all of you need to see. I'm going to share with you this video from the Associated Press. Listen to what these governors of all these different states are speaking with regards to the climate change agreement because they want to implement climate laws within their states. Regardless of Trump's stand on climate change, they are saying we don't care what Trump's doing, we are going forward with this. We want to enact laws in our own independent state. Observe. Thank you. So yes, uh, we need the federal government. We need the president of the United States. But in the meantime, we're going to build the momentum, take concrete actions, as all these different states are. California is, Connecticut, Washington, uh, Hawaii, and many other states. And within about 24 hours of the president uh, purporting to remove us from the Paris Agreement, uh, we had stood up the United States Climate Alliance. And that alliance was formed for the fundamental purpose to make sure that the world understood that we were still in the Paris Agreement. And we are still in the Paris Agreement. To make sure that the rest of the world understood that there is intelligent life in the United States. In my own state of Connecticut, where we've added, we're a small state, where we've added about 94,000 jobs in the last seven and a half years, 22,000 of those jobs are related to what we're talking about at this conference today. This is doable. And we don't need leadership in Washington to make it happen. In fact, last year, the United States emissions fell to the lowest levels in 25 years without any help from Washington. The U.S. is already halfway to the commitment that we made back in Paris. Cities are helping to make that possible, and they will help ensure that we get the rest of the way there, no matter what happens in Washington. So in conclusion, while Washington refuses to act, while homes are lost, while firefighters are dying on the fire line, while Washington invents fake problems and doesn't even solve them, and ignores the real problems that we face, American cities, Republicans and Democrats and independents alike, are saying this is real, and we will take action even if Washington doesn't. You see, ladies and gentlemen, all of this is because of the Pope's encyclical. The Pope's encyclical actually is calling for a national Sunday law within Laudato Si. Laudato Si is the encyclical that hides national Sunday law, the mark of the beast. France right now is displaying exactly what the Paris Agreement is really about because 
they have banned vehicles on the first Sunday of every month for the sake of the environment. And not just this alone, but there's actually a talk right now about wanting to ban working on Sunday. We got a good uh, bitter tug of war starting today's French newspapers. Flo's here on set with more. This is uh, the government ban on working on Sundays, isn't it, Flo? That's right. And this Sunday, several home improvement stores decided to break that ban. And this has caused quite an uproar that's continuing to get a lot of attention here today. Let's take a look at uh, Liberation that talks about sacred Sunday. Uh, and Liberation says having Sunday be a work-free day is an essential part of people's social and family lives but it's colliding with the labor market and France's competitiveness. Uh, so how can you reconcile the two? Uh, Liberation takes a closer look and says that it is indeed possible to reconcile the two. You see, all of this sounds good to the average person when they hear that the government is trying to fight for a work-free Sunday, they are happy. The government is appealing to their family time, their religious time, to make things right amongst one another. All of this sounds good on the surface. Oh, and don't forget, it's good for the environment. It protects the earth. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, what the government and what these agencies are going to tell you is, it's not just beneficial for the human race to rest one day a week, but it's also good to let the earth rest one day a week. And by so doing this, we will allow the earth to cool down and global warming or climate change will reduce the effects of climate change upon the earth will reduce that is how we protect the earth and protect the environment and we protect and sustain human life on earth that my friends is exactly what laudato si is promoting and it sounds nice on the surface but let me tell you this that the sunday movement is making its way into darkness. The end goal is persecution of the saints, persecution of those who choose to keep the laws of God, those that obey the Ten Commandments of the Lord and they have the faith, the testimony of Jesus Christ, which means they are observers of the Lord on His true Sabbath day, not the first day of the week. In fact, the Pope in Laudato Si expresses that Sunday is the first day of the week, not the Sabbath, which in North America is referred to as Saturday. You see, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or whether you don't like it, Bible prophecy is fulfilling and the Word of God is standing the test of time and it's being proven every single day. The signs of the times are showing us that Jesus is coming and that before Jesus comes, the world is about to enter its darkest hour. This is the longest night of Earth's history. While yet it is the darkest hour, it will not be for long, because Jesus is coming. We are about to see the mark of the beast, National Sunday Law, be declared. Right now you may not necessarily believe it. However, it comes in the form of climate change. You are going to start seeing a lot more Sunday movement being promoted. You're going to hear. When you start to hear these things, that is the time for you to start making things right with the Lord. In fact, start making things right with the Lord now. Because if you know, if you have heard the preaching that something as the Sunday law is going to be passed, and you are fully aware of that, when Sunday law is passed, and you think that you can come back to the Lord and make things right, it is too late for you. Probation would have closed. Because now you're coming to the Lord for the wrong reason. You're not coming to make things right. You're not coming to get to know Jesus Christ. You are coming because now you're scared that probation is closing. And that, my friends, is false conversion. And many of you may ask the question, well, what do we do from here? How can I ensure my salvation? How can I be saved? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. 
You see, ladies and gentlemen, this passage of Ecclesiastes goes hand in hand with the three angels' message, which is found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 7. This is the first angel's message. Listen to the following. It says, and I quote, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. This passage, ladies and gentlemen, goes hand in hand with the passage of Ecclesiastes. When you fear God, you will keep His commandments. Keeping the commandments of God is going to be the issue of the final end and conclusion of the great controversy between Jesus Christ and Satan. It revolves around worship. Keeping the laws of God, keeping the Ten Commandments of God, does not strictly remain with thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet, but it also goes to the point of not worshipping any other God, not even believing in any other God, because that is idolatry. And also it does not mean that you are excluded from observing the Sabbath of the Lord. The Sabbath of creation has not changed, my friends. The Lord gave you six days. In the fourth commandment it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It's not the Sabbath of the Jews. It's not the Sabbath of the Hebrews. It's not the Sabbath of anybody else but to the Lord. He gave us six days to do all of our work and to do everything. But his seventh day Sabbath has not changed. So ladies and gentlemen, you that hear this message are without excuse. You cannot say I was not told. What this message, what I'm trying to get you to understand is you must get in the mindset now of overcoming any bad habits. All of us need to overcome any bad habits now. Those that know about this message, when they do not make things right with the Lord because they are waiting to see the sign that a Sunday law is going to be passed or they are waiting for a sign that says, oh, church and state is now a thing and then they're going to run back to the Lord and make peace with the Lord. Their probation would have closed a long time. It would have been too late for them. But for those who have not heard this message and do not know of this truth, they will be the ones who still have time to make things right with the Lord. But they have a short space of time. Do not underestimate the Paris Agreement. Because these things are the main driving force behind the movement of the mark of the beast, the very mark of authority of the papacy, which they said with their own mouths is Sunday sacredness.